Well, good evening. Good to be with you once again on this Wednesday evening as we gather around God's Word. Uh, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. We're studying the book of Ecclesiastes, Life Under the Sun. And uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 4 is where we're going to be at this week. Next week, we'll be in chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. So if you want to read ahead after tonight's message, uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 7, be reading that between now and next week. Uh, that may help you out some uh, to kind of get a grasp of where we're heading. So tonight's chapter 4. Um, and just as a reminder, if you're just now joining this study, you need to go back and watch the first video, okay? Uh, there's a lot of background we have to do uh, to understand uh, Solomon and his writing and how he's writing, why he's writing, all these different things. You're going to be completely lost and maybe become uh, frustrated if you don't watch that first video. So I encourage you to do that if you have not done so already. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be together, to be with you, to be with one another, to, to be around your word. And Lord, we pray for your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts, Lord, to help us to discern this word and also to apply it to our lives that we would glorify you. Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Uh, chapter four is talking a lot about companionship, uh, being together, one another. You see a lot of times in the New Testament, especially uh, love one another, all the one another's that are in the scriptures. And it's talking about relationship, being in relationship and companionship uh, together. And that's how God has designed us to be, uh, to be in relationship with one another. Don't forget, we serve a God who is in relationship, an eternal relationship, the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit eternally together in relationship with one another. Three distinct beings, but yet one God, because they are eternally together uh, in relationship. So when God creates man in his image, uh, part of that image is being pre-wired for relationships. Remember, after God creates Adam, what does he say? It is not good that man should be alone, right? In a perfect world, perfect garden, perfect person, but it's not good that he should be alone. And this is before the fall. So it's not like sin has, has tainted anything yet. But God knows as he creates man. Man is not designed to be alone. He needs a companion. So he creates Eve, right? And so we go from there. That's how God has designed us and God, how God has wired us to be. We can go rogue. We can go and be loners or lone rangers, have a rugged individualism to where it's all about me. That's not how God has designed us to be. That's a very Western thought. Eastern thought is which what Jesus is, you know, in, in, in uh, the Middle East, is, is that we need community. We need one another. That's how the Bible is written, and that's how God has designed us to be. There again, over time, uh, we have become isolationist. Uh, where we want to be alone. Oh, I want my alone time. There's nothing wrong with alone time, but do you see yourself as a lone ranger? God has designed us to be in community and in relationships. Uh, that's how he has designed us. And so we're going to see a couple of things that Solomon is going to show us, that the oppressed are lonely, wealthy business, uh, wealthy people, uh, uh, the person who has all the things of life can be lonely, and even the king can be lonely, right? Loneliness is not how God has designed us to be. He's designed us to be in relationship with others. And so that's what we're going to see here. You're going to see a word. It's going to say, uh, use the phrase, uh, it's better uh, several times. So there again, this is wisdom literature. So and here's, here's one way that you see how things uh, take place in this fallen world which we live in. But it's better to be this way, right? There's that wisdom that's going to come out. It's better together. It's kind of a theme. Better together. If there was a, a title that I could give for this, uh, this study tonight, it would be better together. We're better together. Think that's how God has designed us to be, right? To enjoy life together. All right, so we're going to see some things here. First of all, uh, and as there, again, let me just kind of remind you that uh, that uh, companionship, better together, is the underlying theme. He's going to hit several topics, uh, but you're going to see how this companionship, better together, kind of keeps popping up and raising its head. It's not a blaring theme; it's an underlying theme. So, so keep that in mind as we read this. So, begin with uh, chapter four, verse one. He says, "Again, I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun." And behold, the tears of the oppressed, and they had no one to comfort them. On the side of the, their oppressors, there was power, and there was no one to comfort them. Right? He repeats that. They're being oppressed. There's people that are being oppressed. Um, there again, whether it's psychological or emotional oppression or physical oppression, financial oppression, racial oppression, religious oppression, whatever it is, this world is filled with oppression. People are being oppressed, right? But what does it say? He says, this person is alone. They're tears and they have no one 
to comfort them. To go through life alone is, is a terrible thing. Because here's the reality. I mean, this is what Solomon is saying. There's going to be oppression. <laughs> I mean, there again, if we could think of all the types of oppression that are out there, you and I are going to fit into one of those eventually right? You may not be right now or right this second, but either you have or you will be if you're not already. And so there's all kinds of oppression that is out there uh, taking place. Well, where's your companion? He says, what does it say? They had no one to comfort them. On the side of the oppressors, there was power and there was no one to comfort them. He was repeating himself saying, listen, you need a comforter. You need someone to come along beside you because this world is filled with oppression. Verse two and three, he says, and I thought the dead were already dead, more fortunate than the living who are still alive. But better than both is he who has not yet been born and has not yet seen the evil deeds that are done under the sun. Now we've got to be careful with this passage. And there again, remember what we talked about in the first video is, is that not all these verses are designed to be put on coffee mugs and T-shirts, right? Um, what is he doing? He's using a type of literature, a type of writing or a type of speaking that is, uh, is, is kind of going over the top, if you will. Give you an example. We use this type of uh, speech all the time. Uh, you've, uh, I'm sure everybody's done this, right? You're walking into a store, Walmart or wherever, and you trip over something. You don't fall down, but you, you look awkward. You're flailing around trying to get your balance. You, you catch yourself and you get up. And what's the first thing you do? You look around, right? See if anybody's watching. And it is, you, you know, 20 people are watching you, right? And, you know, then they, they see that you're okay. So maybe they begin to laugh or something like that. Then you're completely embarrassed by it. We've all been there. And as you retell the story, you tell about your, your trip and how you gained your composure, but you looked around and everybody was staring at you and a couple people were laughing. And what do you say? I just wanted to die. No, you didn't, right? You didn't really want to die. It's just you were very embarrassed and it was, you know, you just felt, uh, you know, embarrassment, right? Um, but what do you say? Oh, I just wanted to die. No, nah, you're just, you're stretching it in order to make a point. That's what Solomon is doing here by saying it's better to not be born or the dead have it better than the living do because of oppression. He's just kind of, he's trying to draw your attention to make the point is the, the oppression is always going to be here. That's just the reality. Jesus was oppressed. The early disciples were, the early church, Fox's Book of Martyrs, all these things. Uh, Israel was oppressed over and over by Philistines and, and all their surrounding neighbors. Oppression, oppression, oppression. It is going to be here. It's always going to be here till Christ returns and makes things right. But while you're going through the oppression, do you have someone to comfort you? And that's what Christ has brought to the to the table here, is is that Jesus Christ Himself gives us comfort. Remember, Second Second Corinthians chapter one starts off talking about the the comfort, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our afflictions, so that we can comfort others by the comfort that we ourselves have received. Right. So, what is he talking about here? Is that God has given us an opportunity to be comforted in our oppression through God through Christ and the indwelling Holy Spirit, but also through others, through companionship, through the church. There's a duality that we see, um, and we're going to see in this passage, but also in Scripture, uh, the God that is with us through the Holy Spirit, who's there to, to be with us, our companion, but he also has given us a tangible, physical relationship and companionship in the church, the Christian walk and Christian believers who walk along beside us, right? So we have these companions. Now there again, he's going to go through some things here in just a moment that will drive away people. We need to be aware of these things. And, and, uh, and, and where, where he's going in this is where we spend the most of our life. That's in work, right? So he's talking about oppression, and that's something that we need to be aware of and having companions and seeking out those who are being oppressed and walk alongside of them and seek justice if that is the case, whatever it is. But oppression is here because of the fall. Sin is here. People, the powers will oppress, whatever those powers are. Are we walking and seeking those that we can walk along with or we just not want to get involved, right? Remember the, the Good Samaritan? Remember the, the, those who came by earlier, they just didn't want to get involved, right? But then finally the Good Samaritan comes along and he gets involved uh, with the oppressed. Jesus gives us a parable about that, of those who come along beside, right? Well, here's again, here's the next thing. 
of how those relationships can be can be tainted, if you will. And Solomon goes into an area of our lives where we spend most of our lives, and that is in our work. Because many times um, our work influences how we do the rest of our life. I mean, if you think about that, how you function at work in your workplace is it, it, it sets the tone, if you will, of how you deal with everything and everybody else in your life. OK, um, so he's talking about there uh, the oppressed, but then he goes into uh, the uh, uh, work and toil and how those relationships are uh, seen in that uh, scenario. So look at verse four. Verse four, he says, then I saw that all toil and all uh, skill and work, uh, work come from a man's envy of his neighbor. This also is vanity and the striving after the wind. Let me read that again. Then I saw that all toil and all skill and work comes from a man's envy of his neighbor. This also is vanity, a striving after the wind. Now he's using there again, inflammatory language. He's saying all toil, all work. What is he talking about? He's talking about the person who's obsessed with his work. Why? Because of envy. It's because of envy that he wants more. He's driven by this envy that he doesn't have what other people has or she doesn't have, right? Um, so we see this envious person. What does this envious person do? They can demonize other people that may see, be seen as competitors, right? Begin to attack them or their work ethic or their morals or whatever it is. Begin to gossip about that person to try to cut them down because you're envious. They seem to be on the fast track, right, at work. And you're kind of slowed up here. Uh, maybe they're getting more attention from the boss and, you know, these types of things. And so your envy kicks in. Now, you've been at the company longer, right? Now, they're the newcomer, but yet they're making the fast track to a management position or whatever it is. And so you begin to gossip and to tell lies or whatever. You're demonizing them or you begin to compete with them, right? You're trying to keep up with them or try to outpace them. So you buckle down and you work harder. Now, there again, there's nothing hard with, uh, wrong with hard work. But here's the thing, what's driving this? That's what Solomon is saying, this envy. Toil and, uh, I saw that all toil and all skill and work comes from a man's envy of his neighbor, right? So there's that enviousness of maybe it is. You, uh, you see uh, your friends or your brother-in-law or your, your cousin or your neighbor or whoever goes on these lavish vacations and all these different things, and you don't get to do those things, right? So you're going you're gonna to try to keep up with the, the envy of their life drives you to work harder in order to gain more in order to have that life. And in the process, we're going to see what Solomon talks about. You're driving people away from you, co-workers, employees or employers. You may be wondering why you're stuck in that position because you have this dark cloud of envy around you and people see that. You may not see it, but other people see that in you. And that's what he's talking about here. Envy and rivalry will not produce healthy relationships is what Solomon is trying to say. So we have this aspect of enviousness in our work that's driving what we do, uh, uh, envious of uh, other people's uh, positions or power or finances, their life, whatever it is, and it is driving you to just totally immerse yourself in your work and you're beginning to drive people away. Because here's the thing, you know, and I've seen people like this, you know, you're either going to hook yourself to my train, your wagon to my train or get off the rails, right? And man, I mean, this person may have really brought something to the table or maybe you could have invested in this person and through that investment, they really help out you and the company. But if they don't come in ready to work and ready to get you to achieve your goals, they're out of here. Right. And so that becomes you, there again, you can take that mindset from your workplace and bring it into your personal relationships outside of work or in the church. You can bring those into the church even and have that mindset of either you get on board or you get out. Right. That, that, that drives people. There's there's no companionship in that. You're a lone ranger. Right. People don't want to work with you in that aspect. The other one is laziness. Look at verse five. The fool folds his hands and eats his own flesh. There again, inflammatory language is what he's using. He's not talking about true cannibalism. He's trying to paint a picture here. This person folds their hands. This is not folding your hands to pray and say, thank you, Jesus, for my food. No, what he's doing is he's folding his hands in protest and saying, I'm not working. This is not the working poor. This is the lazy, the person who is able to work, who has the capacity to work, but refuses to work. Why? Because they're lazy. They fold their hands. And they have no food in their pantry to eat. 
It says they begin to eat their own flesh. In other words, it's gnawing away at you. You begin to devour yourself because you don't have, right? And so here's this lazy person. You're just wasting away. You're just destroying yourself. Go out and be productive. Get that job. Go out and do whatever, whatever it is God has enabled you to do. Don't be lazy. Don't be expecting other people to take care of you. Go out and work. Get a job. Do your job, right? That's what, he's, that's what Solomon is saying here. And, you know, many of those people that are lazy, uh, they don't have good relationships, right? Because they're, again, they're mooching off of other people and they're driving those people away. Here's another thing. Very, uh, a lot of people that I've experienced in my life uh, that are lazy, they want to be considered the wisest person in the room, right? Um, you know, that uh, what is, what is uh, uh, Proverbs 26, 16 says, the sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. In other words, here's the, the, the lazy person knows what you ought to do, but they don't do it themselves, right? That, that's the laziness that Solomon is saying. You're driving people away, man. You're not going to build relationships. And God has designed us to be in relationship and to build relationships. And that laziness will drive people away, right? You get people that make up excuses of why they can't work and all these different things. Oh, there's no good jobs out there. Or I don't want to work in retail or this, that, and the other. Right. Proverbs talks about that, too. Proverbs 22, 13 and 26, 13. The fool, the fool says there's a line in the road. In other words, oh, you know, that's just an excuse. There's no really line in the road. You know, it's not it's just coming up with, oh, there's all kinds of dangers out there. I can't go out there and do that. You know, that, that's, that's, that's too low. I, that, that job is underneath me. I can't do that. Hey, listen, you know, listen to some wisdom. And don't be so arrogant and go out and get a job, right? Go out and get a job and support yourself and be, be contribute to your family and to the community. Okay. That's what he's saying here. You know, there again, you're going to be driving people away. If you're the, if you're the lazy person, you're going to find yourself with very few, if no friends whatsoever, no companions. And that's what God wants. He doesn't want you to just have friends. He wants you to have companions. We're going to see here in just a minute what a companion really is in the second part of this study. All right. So now he goes into contentment. Right. So here we have, first of all, the envious person. And then he goes into the lazy person. But here's the content person. So here's a positive. Right. Here's the positive aspect. What he says, look at verse six. He says, better is a handful of quietness than two handfuls of toil, striving after the wind. There again, his picture. He's trying to paint a picture. So uh, it may be kind of confusing. Better is a handful of quietness than two handfuls of toil and the striving after the wind. What is he trying to say? Well, let me give you an example. Have you ever been to a kid's birthday party where they have a pinata, right? Uh, kids love pinatas, and so does America's Funniest Home Videos. We love pinatas because someone's always getting whacked in the head or somewhere else, right? So after all the, you know, after dad gets beat up by the kids with a pinata stick and they finally hit the pinata and the, the candy comes out, how do those kids react to that candy? Two handfuls, right? Getting as much as they can. I was at a party one time where the kid hit a pinata. It busted open and the pinata fell to the ground. One kid picks up the whole pinata and takes off running. And all the other kids, I mean, it must have been like 15, 20 kids, take off after the one that has the pinata. Funniest thing I've seen in a long time, right? That, that That's the picture that he's trying to say here. Two handfuls, that greedy, envious going after things of life, after work and how you view your work, that it's all about gaining, gaining, gaining. Two handfuls, two handfuls of toil, right? That's a striving after the wind is what Solomon says here in this verse. What he says is better. What's better is one hand of quietness. Now, what does that mean? That quietness of spending time with family, with people, with community, spending time with people at church, spending time with loved ones, spending time reading a book or, or going on a vacation or going fishing or whatever it is that you do for a hobby, that quietness, spending time alone with God, that one hand of quietness. And what's the other hand doing in this proverb, if you will? It's working. It's a balanced life is what he's saying. You got two hands of toil that's striving after the wind or one hand of quietness while the other hand is working. He's saying you need to work, but you should have one hand of quietness. There should be an aspect in your life of, of, of this 
this balance of work and rest. That's why God gave us the Sabbath, right? Well, you can Sabbath at any time. It's resting. It's resting in God, resting that the work is done, resting that your day is complete, resting in those relationships, whereas you're spending time with your family, your mind is not back at work. Uh, of how are we going to, you know, how is our company going to compete with the other company? How am I going to compete with my other coworkers? Or I need to do this to make sure that my boss sees these things getting done. Now, where's that hand of quietness of resting in Christ with your family or on vacation or doing a hobby or taking a nap or whatever it is, that one hand of quietness? Because here's the thing, what does that do? That attracts people to you right? That one hand of quietness is there uh, to maintain those relationships while the other hand is at work. It makes you a better employee, right? It makes you a better worker when you have that one hand of quietness because your life is not a, a just toiling after the vanity and a chasing after the wind, right? There's that, that recentering, if you will, of your life because of the quietness that comes in there. So there's a contentment, there again, in order to have that one hand of quietness, you got to have some contentment in your life. Okay, um, that's what he's talking about. This, uh, you know, the contentment that we have um, that we have in Christ. Right. First uh, Timothy six six says there is great gain with god godliness and contentment. There's great gain that comes from that godliness and contentment to be content in our work and in our families and in our past, uh, pastimes or our hobbies, whatever it is that we do, right? Not ending up with two handfuls of a foolish life. That's what he's trying to say here. Look at Jesus. Jesus was content, right? I mean, there was, you know, so much always to be done, um, but Jesus was content. He, he lived in contentment and of the father providing for him, right? Uh, he was doing the father's will. There was a lot more people to heal. There's a lot more people to preach to, but what did he do? He did what the father told him to do. And he was content with that. We don't see Jesus going, father, give me 10 more years. No, he went to the cross when it was his time. His time was up. It's time to go to the cross, more people to heal, more people to minister to, but it was time for him to go. He was content in the father. The next thing he talks about is greed. Uh, chapter four, verse uh, seven and eight. He says, again, I saw vanity under the sun. One person who has no other, either son or brother, yet there is no end to all his toil and his eyes are never satisfied with riches so that he never asked, for whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? This also is vanity and an unhappy business. Here's a picture of a guy who who's so in involved in his work that he doesn't realize he has no one with him. He has no brother. He has no friend. He has no one coming along beside him. He has no one around him. He's he's rich, but he's completely alone. <laughs> that's, that's what he's, it's a vanity. It's a chasing after the wind, right? He's, this, this frantic busyness led to isolation and led to emptiness is what Solomon is saying here. He's rich, but yet he's alone. He has no, no time for personal space or personal time or a social life or church or building relationships. It's all about work. It's all about what I need to do for me and to gain what I need to get. So there's no interaction with anyone else. There's no time for building those relationships with other people. Relationships are more important than achievements is what Solomon is trying to say. You can have all the achievements. You can have all the awards. You can have all the money. But if you don't have relationships, you don't have people, you don't have companions, then what do you have? I mean, we see this a lot of times in, in, in cases of divorce where many times that one spouse could be the husband or the wife. Say, I came in second to my husband or my wife's work. I came in second field. They didn't have time or she didn't have time for me or our children, our family. It was all about work, 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 because they wanted to give us vacations. They wanted to give us cars and give us nice clothes, but we didn't want those things. We wanted them. We want a relationship with them and it caused stress in our marriages and our personal relationships. That's what Solomon is saying. It's a chasing after the wind. You can have everything in the world, but if you don't have companionship, then what do you have? Nothing. You have nothing. Well, he goes on to say that friendship is the blessing. So here's the here's where all these things are I'm talking about greed and envy and laziness and how these affect our work and how we take our work uh uh, life home with us, right? Uh, you may say, well, I don't take my work home with us. Well, your ethics that you gain at work is what you take home with you. 
can't get away from that. It's how you wired yourself to be at work, and it's how you can wire yourself to be at home. Uh, you may be one of those people that um, I can guarantee you, if you're one of those people that your desk or your office is spotless and everything is in its place and everything is organized, I can probably go into your home and your home is the same way. I'm not saying that's a bad thing to have an organized home, but you know, are you the CEO of your boss and the CEO of your home where you will fire someone or you'll demote them if they don't do what you you see, you can take your work home with you and not even know it. That's what Solomon is trying to say. Say, look, you know, understand our work is important, but how you do your work and in relationship with others is a defining moment of how you live the rest of your life. And so friendships are a blessing. Look at verse nine. He says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. Two are better than one. Uh, I, I talked about, uh, I think last week or week before, about going to Mississippi and doing a uh, uh, relief work after Hurricane Katrina. We had people running chainsaws. We had people dragging limbs. I was a limb dragger. It was toil. It was hard work, but I enjoyed it. Why? Because I was with others doing the work. We did a lot of work. I mean, if you think, I mean, the people uh, were so appreciative of the work that we did because we did tons of work, but we couldn't have done that individually. If I would have just went by myself, first of all, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't go out by myself. It's no fun to go out and cut trees and drag limbs by yourself. You want to do it with others. And that's what he's saying here. Our work can become so much greater reward and so much greater as far as what is accomplished when we do it together. And even in ministry, I, I am not always able to do it, but I love to do ministry together. Uh, to go and uh, visit hospitals or do home visits or whatever. Hey, I love it when someone says, you know, I call people every once in a while and say, hey, are you available? And they say, sure. I love to do that. I love to do ministry together, not because it's such hard physical labor, but it just makes it so much more enjoyable to do the work of Christ with others around you. And so there again, a need for relationship in our work and the things that we do, whether it's around the house, um, you know, getting our kids involved and helping your spouse. I'm sure your spouse would enjoy having you come along beside and helping, maybe not necessarily folding the towels, but, uh, you know, whatever it is, uh, transferring the laundry from one machine to another, right? Uh, we'll, we'll let, uh, I'll let my wife do the folding. She doesn't like the way that I fold. But anyway, <laughs> It's better together, right? We get more accomplished. We're spending time with one another. We're communicating with one another. We're building that relationship. Two is better than one. It goes on to say um, uh, in the aspect of helping, look at verse 10. For if they fall, one will help up his fellow. But woe to him who is all alone when he falls and has no one, another one to lift him up. There again, he's, he's, you know, people back in those days knew what he was talking about. If you're traveling somewhere, it was dangerous. You had bandits and robbers and wild animals. And so if you're traveling from one city to the next and you fall and break an ankle, man, you're just a sitting duck. You're just susceptible to everything that is around you. You can't get up and walk. But it's better to have someone walking along that can help you up. Help, I can't get up. You know, I've fallen. I can't get up. Remember that old commercial, right? Needed help. And that's the thing is that we need help in life, not just the physical things, but also the emotional, the spiritual, uh, the, all those things in life and the physical. We need people's help. There again, are we building those relationships in Christ or are we driving them away because we want to go at it alone? The Bible tells us we need help from one another. Help pull each other out of sin and despair and uh, depression and, and emotional things. All these things. To, uh, Galatians chapter 6 tells us to bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens. Hebrews chapter 10, um, verses 19 through 25. Let me just uh, just kind of um, hit some of the highlights of those passages. Here's what, here's what the Hebrew writer says. Listen to the plurality of these words. Let us, community one another. Let us draw near to God. Let us draw near to God, right? Not just you alone. You go figure it out. And you go live your Christian life. No, let us draw near to God. And verse 23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. We need one another in our walk with Christ. Let us, he says, hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. In other words, I'm going to help grab a hold of your faith and you grab a hold of my faith and we're going to hold each other's faith. And when we progress and to, to, this, uh, to this faith and this hope that we have in Christ Jesus, we need one another because at times my hand will slip from that rope of hope and I need you to grab a hold of that 
that rope for me and put my hand back on the rope. Let us do these things. Verse 24, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. We need to spur, we need one another to help us to, to go and to keep going, right? Uh, I shared Sunday about um, uh, uh, some things that uh, uh, weight loss. Um, I've, I've lost uh, over 35 pounds, and and, uh, and Tay and I are doing this uh, this healthy eating and healthy living type thing. And um, and and both of us are doing this, and both of us have lost significant weight. But what do we, there's times when we're just like, I just want a pizza. I just, I just want to go out and I just want to give this up. This is tough. This is hard. I just want to give up. And the other one, whether it's me doing that or Tanya doing that, we're there to get to spur one another on in this process. Hey, look at, at what all we've accomplished. Let's don't give up now. Let's keep on going. I know, you know, we may want a pizza or we may want whatever, but we're not going to do that. We're not going to give up. Same thing in our spiritual life is we're there for the one another's to spur one another on to love and to good deeds. And also it says there, let us not give up meeting together. Let us spur one another to, to be here, to be a part of the community of Christ, to be a part of church, a small group, Sunday school, whatever it is, youth group, whatever it is, spur one another on to come together. Hey man, been missing you at church. Need you, where you been? I'm not trying to get into your business, but I miss you. We're better together. Remember that's the theme. We're better together. Spur one another on to keep meeting together, to be there as a comfort and an aid to one another in those times of, of helping, of needing of help, right? Also, um, in comfort and giving other support, look at verse 11. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. How can one keep warm alone, right? So he's not just giving advice on how to stay warm if you're camping, right? I mean, that's what he's talking about. Is, uh, the illustration he's giving is, is that uh, being out uh, at night alone, um, it's just simple logic, right? I mean, bodies give off heat. And so if you want to stay warm, you better snuggle up to someone, okay? Um, that's what he's talking about, you know. Um, giving that emotional support, uh, that physical support, whatever it is. Sometimes people just need a hug. Sometimes people just need you to be close to them. That's what he's saying. You need to be there. Be close to one another. And there, I, I know that the what we're doing, this video platform, um, this video, uh, whether it's Sunday or Wednesday or uh, other things that we've done, um, I, I've, I've heard from people um, that this just isn't satisfying. And you're right. It's not. It's not designed to be. This this platform of video uh, messaging and all these things, this is not how God has designed the church to function. This is how we have to function in this time. And I believe very quickly that we will be back to the one another, the, 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 the body to body, if you will. Right. Um, maybe not physically because of social distancing, but you know what I mean. And that's, Solomon is not necessarily talking about that being physically physically pressed together, but here it is, being in relationship with one another in a closeness, in a proximity that technology cannot suffice. We should not be content with video, whatever. Uh, we need to be together. That's how the, the New Testament is. I mean, if you if you just want to say, well, I'll just do church online from here on out. I'm able to go to church, but hey, it's just more convenient to stay at home and watch on video. Just take the book of Acts out. Because that's what the book of Acts is being together. They were in one accord. They were with one another. That's how God has designed us to be. There again, if you're sick, we want to keep a video platform for you because there are times and there are seasons where you need to use this. And that's fine. God's given us this uh, technology, but this should not replace the being together. So as things begin to open up, hey, Come on and let's be together, right? It may be uh, some time for some of you and that's okay, but keep in mind that goal of being together, all right? So there again, it's a relationship. You can't replace it. You cannot replace the, the relationship of being together in the, in the same place. Also, the protection aspect, verse 12, and though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. There again, protection. We need one another to protect ourselves to not just the physical protection, um, but the spiritual protection as well. It's why God gave us the church to look out for one another, to have each other's back. Say, hey, man, uh, you, you're slipping here. You know, um, there, there's, I'm seeing some things in your life that, that maybe Satan's getting a stronghold and in, in, uh, your, your demeanor is beginning to change change. That's the accountability aspect. We need one another for this protection. We have the protection of Christ and of the church. And uh, those two working in conjunction together is what Solomon is talking about. You need other people. 
just keep that keep that in mind. You need others with you in your walk and in your life, in your marriage, in your job, in all these things of life, in raising your children, in your finances. You need other people involved in your life. So we have Christ, have the Holy Spirit within us, but we also have one another. That's what God's gift is the one another's. And it goes, it kind of changes gears, if you will. He's talking about leadership, um, but also how that affects those relationships. So look at verse 13. Verse 13, he says this, better was a poor and wise youth than an old and foolish king who no longer knew how to take advice. For he went from prison to the throne, though in his kingdom he had been poor. I saw all the living who move about under the sun, along with that youth who was to stand in the king's place. There was no end of all the people, all of whom he led. Yet those who come later will not rejoice in him. Surely this also is a vanity and a striving after the wind. Okay, now what is Solomon talking about here? Let, let, let's take this bit by bit and, and let me kind of give you an overview of what he's saying. He's kind of coming up with this little story of two different kings, right? Um, they're again, not based on anything that, uh, uh, that we're looking at in the book of Kings or Chronicles. Just He's just telling a story. There's two kings, right? You have the old king and you have a young king. And the old king was a fool, right? And so what is he saying? He was talking about leadership and the need for humility because here was an old king. He was a rags to riches type story. He was poor. He was in prison. And now all of a sudden he's the king. But along the way, he quit listening to people. He quit having people pour into him and gaining wisdom. And he became a fool. He lost his kingdom. Um, humbly seeking the counsel of, of wise people, he became an isolationist instead of seeking that counsel. And he became the fool. That's what it talks about here. In other words, just because you're old doesn't mean you're wise. Wisdom comes from humble godliness over time. That's what the, the point that, that uh, Solomon is trying to say here. Wisdom comes from humble godliness over time. If you're taking notes, you may want to write that down. Wisdom comes from humble godliness over time. Now, there again, just because you're old doesn't mean that you're wise. You're getting older, but are you getting wiser? Okay, because here's the thing. You can be young and be wise. It's that humble godliness over time. Now, that time may be a year, two years, uh, maybe in your 20s. You went through a drug addiction, an alcohol addiction or whatever, but you sought the Lord and the Lord brought you out of that. And it may have been a two year time span. You've learned a lot. You have a lot of wisdom that you gained through humble godliness, submitting yourself to God to, to change you and to take these things from you and to go through those struggles and to rely on God and to rely on Christ and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And you went through this process. You have been humbly uh, God, uh, you have this humble godliness over that time frame that has made you wise in that area. Now, you, it doesn't mean you're like Solomon; and you have total wisdom. It just means that you have gained some wisdom. You gained some life, right? Um, the school of hard knocks is a lot of times what we call it. You gain some wisdom from that. So, age is, doesn't necessarily mean that uh, that the older you are, the wiser you are. You can be an old fool. There again, you know, what they say you can't teach, teach an old dog new tricks. That should not be the case for a Christian. Old dogs should learn new tricks. We should be humbly teachable all of our life. Hum humility and teachability is what it means to be a disciple. Just because you're older doesn't mean you have all the answers. Yes, you've been there and you've done that, but you haven't done everything. You haven't been everywhere and done everything. You may have been there and done that, and there may be wisdom in the things that you have done and things you have been through. But it doesn't mean you have all wisdom. Right. You still need to learn as well. So there again, age does not necessarily equal wisdom. It's it's humble godliness over time that gives wisdom. So there again, don't think you have it. Don't think you have all the answers or, you know, all the things, you know, you know, you know how to live a Christian life. You know how to do things. So you're just on cruise control as you get older. No, you need to be teachable all your life, all the way to the grave, right? Younger leaders can be wiser than older leaders. Matter of fact, uh, David says that in Psalm 119, 100, he says, I understand more than the aged for I kept your precepts. There again, so, uh, David in this Psalm, he, he's not being arrogant. He's just saying, I understand more than those who are older than me because I've stayed in God's word. <laughs> I've learned from him. I'm humbly growing in godliness over time where those who are older than me think they know it all. And so they've set their Bibles aside. They think they have it all under control. 
He says, I understand more than they do. That's God's word. Job chapter 12, verse 20 says that God takes away discernment of the elders. Just because you're there again, you may have discernment as a younger person, but that discernment is only so much. And as you grow older, if you leave that discernment aside, God will remove that. It doesn't mean he takes away your wisdom. It's just you're not growing in wisdom, right? He wants you to grow in your wisdom as you go humbly discerning and humbly growing in godliness over time. Okay, um, it's not the age that makes the difference. It's the heart. It's not the age. It's the heart. Do you have a heart of a learner? No matter what age you are, no matter what position as a pastor, I, I learn from you. Hopefully you learn from me. We're learning from one another. That's where the companionship comes in is learning from one another. That's what the, this story is about in these last few verses that he gives here in, uh, in chapter four. All right. So the question is, will you be a humble and teachable, humble and teachable all of your life? Or you just figure that you have it all figured out. Right there again, you're not going to see much worth in your companions or much worth in the advice of others, um, whether they're young or old, because you have it all figured out. Right. And you need to realize that this life is short lived. And that's kind of the last part he talks about there in verse 16. Um, it, it says uh, there was no end to all the people, all whom he led. Yet those who come later will not rejoice in him. Now, he's not saying that they're going to hate the person. They just don't remember him. Right. I mean, that's the thing. Um, you know, uh, one king replaces another king. Right. One president replaces another president. One pastor replaces another pastor. And so, you know, what are we going to see? There, there's there's time moves on. Time goes on. Learn what you can in this moment from from what God has placed in your life at this moment. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, that I've tried to do um, there again, what was taught to me was uh, even in jobs. Right. Even in bad jobs. I had some bad jobs. I had some bad employers, bad bosses, bad scenarios at work. But here's what I've always tried to do is learn from those situations. You can always learn what not to do. <laughs> I've had some bosses. I learned from their uh, mistakes of what not to do or not to, how to treat their employees. Um, one of the, the greatest uh, and most humbling things I've ever had when I worked uh, for a trucking company, J.B. Hunt, I was the shop manager in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, and I was there for two years. And uh, th that shop had a season. I was there when it opened and I was there when it closed. We had it was a two year span that we had the shop there and just the company was just doing company things. So those things come and go. But I learned, man, the, the place, the, the shop I worked in prior to that one, my boss, it was it was horrible. I mean, I could sit here and t spend the next hour telling you all the things I went through. I learned how not, how to treat my employees by how I was treated or not treated. So when I had that shop, when I was managing that shop, I, I did certain things with my employees to try to help build them up and encourage them and so on and so forth. One of the greatest things, and, and I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to give praise to me. I give praise to God for his discernment and his wisdom in my life that when we closed that shop, I had so many employees. I had 24 employees that we had to, uh, you know, dismiss and find other jobs. We helped them uh, in the process, transition process. But here's what they came and said to me. I was young. I, I think when I left that shop, I think I was 25 years old, 26 years old, maybe in my, my mid twenties. I was the manager of 24 people in a 24, seven, seven day a week shop. And here was these guys, all of them were older than me. <laughs> and they all came to me when it was all said and done and said, this was the only job I ever had I woke up and wanted to come to work. You made our work environment a great place to come to. Man, that, that was that was better than anything I could receive from the company or accolades or trophies or plaques or anything is to have people come to me and say, you made this a great work environment. Thank you for what you did. And there again, what did I do? I gave God, gave God the glory that it was God who was working in me to humbly learn and apply wisdom that I've gained through my years, short years, but humble godliness over time to learn how to be a good boss and a good employer. So, you know, there again, you know, you can learn even from bad situations. God has placed you in that you can learn some things. And are you humble or are you teachable? So we see just to summarize this passage, we see comfort. Uh, for the oppressed, we receive comfort from God and comfort from the church, contentment in Christ, and also contentment in our relationships, right? Also community. That's the main thing. We're better 
together, better together. Christ went through uh, the oppression for us. Christ shows us, and he went through discomforting times to show us what it is to be content. And Christ shows us what it is to be in community with one another and in what it is to be in love, that, that aspect of love that the New Testament talks about, to love one another another. Be in community together. Be patient, be humble, be loving, be learning from one another in this uh, environment that God has given us, right? Christ has come. He shed his blood on the cross uh, for us to be saved and be in relationship with him. Relationship is key. How are you doing on your relationships in the church, in your family, in your workplace, in your community? How are those relationships? Are you pointing people to Christ or is it all about you? That's the main thing, I believe, what Solomon is trying to show us. Listen, it's bigger than you and me. This is about God and his kingdom. We're, we're partakers in that kingdom, and are we advancing his kingdom? Well, let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for what you have shown us in your word. And Lord, we just pray that you would help us to build those relationships, to see the importance of one another, to see the importance of our companions, and see the importance of how we do our work. Lord, that we would build one another up, to spur one another on to love into good deeds. Lord, help us as we live this life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for being here. I hope this was a blessing to you, and may God bless until next time.